Stay tuned as the doctors update the status of the Affordable Care Act tonight on call. Funding for on-call television is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. My mama told me you better shop around. Uh -huh. You better shop around. Commonly called Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act has roots that reach far into our past. It's time for an update on where we've been and where we're headed when the doctors are on call tonight. Tonight our program has been recorded earlier and so please hold your questions but we invite you to go to your website, our website, and make your comments either positive or negative. Feedback is how we get better. Welcome to On Call Television. Well the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act or ACA lovingly referred to by both sides as Obamacare is the first major health care financing change since Medicare and Medicaid. Despite facing significant political opposition, Pre President Obama guided it through Congress. It withstood an appeal to the Supreme Court, and now we have a law that has been evolving for about two years. The major part of the health care insurance law has become reality, requiring insurance companies to insure anyone asking for it, and requiring everyone to have insurance. Here is the ACA journey as of today. Health insurance and the costs of not having health insurance have been debated in the United States for over 100 years. In the early 20th century, as Europe and the United Kingdom were enacting socialized health care, most Americans rejected the idea of the government providing health insurance. It wasn't until the 1965 Social Security Act that the United States offered its first government-administered health care system called Medicare and Medicaid. Since then, several health care reforms have been proposed but never gained enough public support. In 1989, the Heritage Foundation proposed an individual mandate for health insurance and as a market-based method to health care. Since the 1990s, health care reform has been an issue every president has tried to tackle. The Obama administration is the first to sign into law an act that requires every individual to have health insurance. On March 23, 2010, the President signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act into law. In the first year, the ACA required insurance companies to cover children with pre-existing conditions and young adult children up to age 26. Insurance companies were also to remove lifetime limits on essential health benefits such as emergency services, maternity and newborn care, prescription drugs, laboratory services, preventive and wellness services, and pediatric services. In 2011, the ACA required prescription discounts and Medicare preventive services for seniors. The law also required a new 80-20 rule, which says only 20% of premiums collected by insurance companies can be spent on administrative and marketing costs. 22 preventive care services for women were required in 2012. These services include breast cancer screenings, well-woman visits, and domestic and interpersonal violence screening and counseling. 
insurance companies were also required to provide customers with a new, easy-to-understand summary of benefits and coverage and a uniform glossary. Health insurance open enrollment and the marketplace at healthcare.gov opened in October 2013. 2014 brings marketplace coverage, coverage for pre-existing conditions, and federal assistance for monthly premiums and out-of-pocket costs. Medicaid expands in some states and annual limits on essential benefits ends. Insurance companies may still levy yearly and lifetime limits of up to $2 million on non-essential benefits. Americans have until March 31, 2014 to enroll in a health care plan, apply for assistance with premiums and out-of-pocket expenses, or apply for a health insurance exemption. For more information, visit healthcare.gov or call 1-800-318-2596. Well, the ramifications of these changes are happening all around us, and we thought it was time to bring two very informed experts on the topic to discuss the ACA and give us perspective. Dr. Tom Dean was raised and practices family medicine in Washington Springs, trained at the University of Rochester School of Medicine, the residency at the University of Washington, Seattle, and is on the powerful National Committee of Medical Experts called MedPAC, or was up until this last month, or last, this last this year, spring. advising the U.S. Congress on health care policy. Dr. Paul Amundsen from Sioux Falls is the medical director at Dakota Care. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of South Dakota and received his medical degree from the Indiana University School of Medicine. He is board certified in family practice, serves as a clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Sanford School of Medicine at USD, and is an active member of the American Academy of Family Physicians, the South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, National Academy of Managed Care Physicians, and just goes on and on. Have I said enough? You said it all. So, uh, you, you know, and you also travel to Nicaragua to do volunteer I work every year. For many years, and we leave again in a few weeks. Oh, wow, that's really neat. Quite a, a contrast from American healthcare, but it certainly gives you more of a perspective, uh, especially with the discussions we're going to have tonight. Yeah, this is a wonderful combination. Two family physicians and a general internist talking about this ACA. We're, we're, uh, you're a medical director of an insurance company, and you have been up until this, this spring, this spring yeah. uh, uh, deeply involved in national health care policy. And so we've got... I, Rick, I should probably say just to, for full disclosure, I'm also on the board of the Avera Health Plan, so oh. I... So you're... But, you, 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 I'm involved a little bit in the insurance, insurance part of it too. part of it too. So I think this is great. So everybody is wondering what's going on. There's been a lot said. There's all sorts of politics going on. A lot of confusion. On. And I, I think uh, that uh, this is the, the moment that we have to try to bring, bring it to the front. Now, let me start with maybe the first question. What do you think people don't understand about the ACA the most? I'll talk, start with you, Tom. I think uh, that the, the thing that actually, to me, is the most important part of the, of the, the law that has gotten very little attention is the impact it's having on the medical profession and the reorganization that's taking place in the in the medical profession as uh, providers become more and more aware that we have to be much more sensitive to what things cost and and we're seeing a significant slowdown in medical care costs at least in part because of that it's a complicated issue but uh, the thing that has gotten all the attention are the insurance requirements and that's important but the law is much broader and, and uh, has many more important facets to it. To try to bring down costs. To try to bring down costs. And I, I think there's every reason to believe that that, that will happen. Uh, we're in a transition time that has a lot of rocky road, a big element of, of a rocky road because lots of changes are taking place and some of them uh, require people to be shifted from one policy to another and that's disruptive and so there's a lot of turmoil right now but uh, I, uh, I think that we are moving in the right direction but we've got a long ways to go. Well not only does it work on trying to control costs but the big thing is it's, it's allowing everybody to get insurance. Exactly I mean I I really come from the premise that we needed to do this 
because I think probably all three of us would agree that when people are sick, they should get care. They should be taken care of. Yeah. And second of all, the, the, the just abundant evidence that our existing system simply wasn't working very well. Okay. So we need change. Now, beyond that, we've had lots of argument about uh, what direction the change should take. And, and we need that because these are immensely complicated problems. Okay. And we need the best minds uh, to working be on it. working but on it. But they should be listening. They sh Rick, Tom makes an excellent point I, that I want to elaborate on, what, it, that the country's uh, cost of health care has gone up to, to uncontainable un levels. I think 18 percent of our gross domestic product is on health care costs. It has started to slow in the last maybe two years, probably even predating affordable care because yeah. of the, the economic slowdown in 08 and 09, but it's still you know, at a growth rate that is not sustainable. And, and one of the reasons, and, and to even go back even further, is why was this even done is because you know, as a country, we're paying so much, but we're getting such poor general uh, value for our, for our care. I think the last good comparison I saw to other developed countries is we're somewhere like 27th for what right. the for value of care. for yeah. value yeah, yeah. we're getting from the money. Yeah. And we need to find better ways if we're gonna, if we're gonna say that we're gonna invest 17, 18 percent of our gross domestic product, then by gosh, we should be number one by far compared to all of our the other developed countries and we're not. we're not. So how do you find a way to I use those that. resources and at the same time dramatically elevate the value, the quality of that care that we're getting and and I think that's why I think, this is my personal opinion, that's why I think the the the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which I would say probably reworded to accessible, meaning health, more accessible to health care. I'm not sure that the provisions, and we can hopefully talk about that, are in as written are necessarily going to save money. Uh, but they are going to try to provide access. But they're going to certainly expand access to people for more affordable health care insurance. Right. If you look at it, it's health care financing. And we have gone this private insurance route all these years. We're the only country that does just this or has done this. Well, well we've got Medicare and Medicaid but, in. But there are other, other countries, and we'll use Canada, for example, that they do have a private insurance component. And it comes back to the fundamental question is, is having health insurance a right or a privilege in this company, in this country? country? And that's a fundamental question I think we all as Americans have to, have to answer. Well, and if you, if, if, if you think that you, um, you, we aren't providing it to the very poor, we are. They just go to the emergency room, which is True. by far the worst, I mean, nothing against it, that it's the worst health care because it's calamity worth uh, health care. It it's doesn't do the preventative. band -aid care, and, very and expensive. They're, they're very liable there, so they CAT scan everything, and it's just very, very expensive. I, I think that the, the one issue that the public probably doesn't uh, appreciate is how disturbing the things are that Paul just alluded to, the quality of our outcomes. Because we, the media plays up big all the spectacular things that happen in our academic centers and the, the remarkable uh, things that they uh, can bring about. But when you actually look at the health of our population, it is significantly uh, worse than, than uh, quite a number. I, I looked this up in the, the OECD, which is a, a group of 34 developed countries that share economic data. We rank 25th out of 34 in life expectancy. Uh, countries like Slovenia, people live longer than they do in the United States. And, and we rank 32nd out of 34 for infant mortality. Now, these are complicated issues, but those are just really rough guidelines of the fact that, that our people are not as healthy as they should be, or well, could be. They're not getting. I mean, they're get, not getting as much preventive care as they could. Now, let's. I want to. I want to clarify one com comment. Uh, some people have said that this whole, the major reason that we need to do health care reform isn't so much just that quality issue. It's two points. One is access. We need to get access for everybody to have uh, financing to help them. Access out. to care or access to both. Access, structure. access, payment that will allow you to go to to have a doctor or a, care, a nurse practitioner or a PA. You have access to primary care, access to health care instead of just an emergency room. Everybody should have access. Everybody should be able to say, "I have a doctor." Or and that's, that's, I think that's the premise of, of the the commentary that was on earlier about uh, essential health benefits and well, and the you know the government has decided this is your list of essential health benefits and. That's yeah. what we're all, we all insurance plans right. across the board, even if you're 64 and married and 
you still get maternity benefits, and you're, we're all going to pay for that. Yeah. So there's a there's a trade-off. Yeah, right. And then the second component is controlling costs. We have got to be able to figure out why we're spending twice as much money as the next ten most expensive healthcare provider countries in the world. We are twice as expensive, and yet we're not on that top list of quality met parameters. So what can we do about costs, and how do we provide access? I think just on, on the, uh, the, the payment issue, one of the things that I've raised a couple of times is that when you stop and think about it, our payment system is so perverse. Hospitals only do well when patients do poorly. And, and, and doctors do better when patients have lots of complications. That is a perverse system. Now, it pushes not, people to do worse. I, I, would, I would not in any way imply that that's the intent of any of those providers. But in fact, we get, we get paid more when people do poorly. Yeah. Yep. And that's wrong. Right. And the more we do, the more tests we do, the more we do, the yep. more we make. Yep. So that's wrong, too. And, and I think there are some, some things that are being worked on uh, around the, the country, uh, even in South Dakota, to try to, to exactly. start start yeah. the process of altering this into more of a fee for service, which which away you alluded to, service, yeah. away from to more value based reimbursement. It will take a generation to make that that entire change. But it also brings up one other thing: is that what was the what was the underlying reason that we started having health insurance years ago? I mean, back in the Blue Cross Blue Shield days, uh, it was just for basic hospital care, and it's expanded a lot. I mean, it's certainly, we as a country have decided that health insurance pays for just about everything. One of my jobs is try to determine what's reasonable to for coverage and what's not, and th those are very difficult changes to make. Those are usually made by committees of physicians, just like what Tom was alluding to with the with the Avera Health Plan. You, you, one person doesn't shouldn't just make those. You know, those have to be made by, by thought leaders in, in collegial, uh, types of discussions to try to figure those things out and it's very difficult to know how much should we cover the government has came into saying these are going to be essential health benefits okay but what about everything else what about all these new high expensive the very, very uh, oncology expensive stuff. drugs that you're very well of that that With offer a very limited a little bit of uh, uh, additional benefit I mean, those are difficult, difficult discussions issues. for us to make for the next minute and a half I want to talk about expanding Medicaid because that's something that hasn't happened in the state of South Dakota didn't happen in 19 or 20 other states in this country uh, partly po a political reason I suppose I don't know people feel that there's they're worried that the the, na the national government will back down and then the state will be stuck with a, in a, in a, in a an increased Medicaid bill I would start with you Tom what do you what do you think? I mean, I mean uh, Paul, what do you what do you think? What do you think, Rick? What Tell me you, what you think well, about Medicaid. I think that we should expand it, but uh, uh, we, I think we've all heard what Governor Dugard uh, said. But why was he saying yesterday? This? Why did? Well, he? I think he's. I think his hope is that, and there's there's roughly about twenty five thousand uninsured uh, South Dakotans that that I think that are estimated at this time, and I think from what I heard, his hope is to at least initially expand it into those who are. Uh, the single parents who are really struggling, the kids in, in general are on, but the parents might, or the parent might not be. I think he's really looking for a way to, to kind of slowly gauge this in. There's been a lot of arguments that, that it's, econo it's an economical boom to South Dakota to expand Medicaid because it's going to bring in all these federal dollars. I'm a little skeptical on that argument because I think the biggest argument against it is what if the feds say, well, I guess we can't, we can't afford to, to kick in the 90% anymore, yeah. that the rest of it's on you. That's, I think, the, that's the largest skepticism in a conservative legislature that yeah. we have. I understand. And I appreciate the and I And I, I appreciate the fiscal conservative nature of that, our, that of the, our, state. our state government has. Me too. I, yeah. I think that, I mean, I'm Quickly. strongly in favor of the expansion. And I think that even if, first of all, Medicaid's been around for 50 years. There's never been a default. But even if that should happen, we're no worse off than we are today. Uh, because people go on and off Medicaid all the time. We would have to uh, tighten up and, and raise the eligibility standards and so forth. But, but we'd be no worse off than we are today. And, and the, the expansion of Medicaid helps the whole state. It helps uh, the, the recipients. It helps people that are insured because their premiums are not paying for uncompensated care. It helps hospitals. It helps to stabilize uh, community facilities. I see no reason whatsoever to wait. 
Okay, that, and, and, and your, your follow-up. The, the, the gap right now exists between the people at, at approximately 100% and 136% of the federal poverty level. Those are the ones that we have to decide as a, as a state, how are we going to cover those people who are the working 40, poor? 40,000. 40,000 of them. Yep. All right, we'll, we'll be back. The new health care process can be confusing, especially to anyone who has been without health insurance for many years or has never had it in the first place. Each state has assistance <coughs> available to help you find health insurance. These helpers are called navigators. Kim Jones of the Inner Lakes Community Action Partnership in Brookings explains what a navigator can do for you and how to find one. Well, there are four ways to sign up on the health insurance marketplace. You can go on the internet and work through the website. You can fill out a paper application and mail that in. You can use a 24-hour call center uh, they have people, operators available 24-7, and they have translator services for 150 different languages. Or you can come to a navigator. Navigators have two primary responsibilities. The first is to provide outreach and education regarding the Affordable Care Act to let people know what it's all about and to answer questions. And the second component of our job is to uh, enroll people through the marketplace and to assist them with the enrollment process. We have 18 navigators working for the Community Action Partnership, and they're located in all areas of the state and cover all 66 counties. We do have access to translator services. That is part of our uh, grant requirement that we can either utilize the call center and work with the consumer and the call center translators, or many of us have tr translator services that we can utilize. We're working with some people who maybe haven't been covered by health insurance for a long, long time, if ever. And terms like deductibles and co-pays and formularies are all new. And so we've had to do a lot of explaining to people to clarify that. We've also enlisted the help of the, the insurance providers to explain certain components of the plans to, to make sure that the consumer makes an informed choice. The thing that's really helping most of the consumers is if they're qualified to receive those tax credits that will help to bring down the cost of those monthly premiums. Uh, and anyone between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level is likely to be eligible to receive some of those tax credits. And those can really help dramatically to make the plans more affordable. Um, likewise, if your income is at 250% of the federal poverty level or lower, you can get additional help in reducing the deductible amount for the course of the year and your maximum out-of-pocket expenses and your copay. So there are a lot of advantages, but the only place to get those reductions, to get that additional help, is through the marketplace. The people who have enrolled are very pleased with the impact of the tax credits and the cost reductions. Um, we have some people um, because they fall through that coverage gap because South Dakota has not expanded Medicaid. We are experiencing some of those folks who don't have a coverage option right now. Um, and uh, so those folks will have to apply for an exemption. But other than that, um, we've had kind of a nice, a nice month of, of getting people through the process. Navigators are, are more than willing to help. Um, you can locate a navigator on the healthcare.gov website or by looking at interlakescap.com and we have a navigator locator there too and we'll be happy to help. Well, that's it. very interesting what she had to, to add there, that there is help available and you can go to the internet. I mean, how easy is the internet now? I mean, is it working? And how do you know if, you're, if subsidies are available to you? And is it something you can jump into or wh what do we do? Well, I think, first of all, we need to realize that the, the uh, exchange of the marketplace is really only relevant to about 20% of the population right now, because about 80% of the population gets insurance either through a, a, an existing government program like Medicare or through their employees. So it, it applies to, you know, 20%. A, about 20% of the state. And, and uh, the people that can buy insurance uh, on the, the only people right now that can buy insurance on the uh, 
exchange, or as they now want to call it, the marketplace, uh, are those that will get some sort of, of government subsidy, and that goes up to 400% of the poverty level. Which is about an income uh, of 80%, it's 80, a, it's a, Yeah, I've got it here someplace, but I think for a family of four, it's somewhere around 75,000. It, it's a significant it's amount a significant, for South yeah. Dakota. Family uh, of four, though. Yeah, yeah. It's a, Incomes. Yeah. So, but that's also, to, to reiterate, or to expand on what Tom said, it's only for people who are on the individual plan, those yeah. who cannot get coverage from either their employer or they're an independent person. Small groups, employers less than 50 are not currently required to uh, provide insurance for their employees. Most do in this state because we have a low un, uh, unemployment, so as an incentive to get employees, they want to provide health insurance. Uh, that has been kicked back at least another year. So right now, for, for the large employers, for for the for small, small employers, for the, can shop, use, yeah. for the for the ones that the small employers, I think under 25, can use the exchange, but it's kind of an awkward paper process. As right, I the, understand. The, the it's, shop. It's, it's has, not a it's not an online process right now. But they can they can go to the website to learn about what kind of subsidies might be available. Bottom line is there's a lot of confusion yeah, because a lot, a lot of se several of the rules have been pushed right, back a year or right. two. Some of these right. people, and one of the well, questions has been, can I still keep my policy? President Obama promised we can right. keep our own physician, right. we can keep our own policy, where millions of people are finding they can't keep their policy because they ended up having something that was considered inferior that now with these new... They didn't have coverage for mammograms. And that they, they didn't have the, all, the, all the, the requirements and all those cost money and they're finding out that those new policies, whether it's bronze, silver, or gold, whatever metal level, are a lot more expensive. And that, that's a, it's an eye-opening thing to a lot of people, but you know, that's what insurance costs. I want to ask, okay. The, 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 the people that, that they, it, it gets, this all gets complicated, but people who have kept the same policy since 2010 are so-called grandfathered. They can keep their policy, even if it doesn't meet the federal requirements. For a year. But, no, well, I think I you're think talking about employer groups. Yes, individuals have to uh, send in a, a a document to uh, Human Health Health and Human Services saying that I need an exemption because of some of I these think, hardships. E I think even if even if the individuals if the individuals had a so-called grandfather policy, I think they can keep that. I believe, but again. It's, it, 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 the bottom it, line it, is there's a lot of confusion. There, there's well, a lot of confusion because thing. it's yeah. very complex. It's just a complex I, issue. I want to ask about the metals, you know, the bronze, the copper, the tin, the whatever. <laughs> bronze, kind. silver, gold levels. Okay, gold levels. So it's a three tiered system of healthcare. Four. I mean. There's a platinum level, isn't oh, there? That's true. There yeah. is. Oh, wow. Platinum, even. But, but before that, I wanted to ask about the fact that an employer could reduce the hours that a person is employed to less than 30 and then wouldn't have to cover them for insurance. Explain that to me. The, the law requires that employers who have over 50 full-time employees have to provide health insurance. Now, in fact, at that level, most of them already do, although not all of them. But the, so one of the, the problems that has developed is that some employers have uh, said, well, I don't have 50 full-time employees. I've got, I reduced a number of my employees to under 30 hours, and so they no longer qualify as full-time. And so I don't have to meet that requirement. I, that got a lot of media attention in the beginning. My understanding is it probably isn't as big, it hasn't affected as many people as maybe the media implied. But for those people that were subjected to those kind of changes, that's a, that's, a, that's a rough deal, and, and I think that's a real defect in the law. Uh -huh. and, and I don't exactly know how that can be altered. I'm sure there are ways to fix it, but... I think if we scream bloody murder enough, you know, if the people who are involved raise the, uh, enough ruckus with peer to start with, uh, then we would know it's happening and... and uh, now, it's, it's possible that... that once those folks <coughs> drop below 30 hours, and they're, uh, they would then be eligible to go into the individual market, and if their incomes are uh, low enough, and they probably uh, would be, and they may well be low enough because of the, the standards that we talked about, uh, they they may well be able to get uh, a subsidized policy through the the marketplace or the exchange. What's your comment? My comment goes back to the metal levels, just so people understand these metal levels relate to. 
uh, the amount of coverage they get. And, and a bronze level, which although may seem very inexpensive, has a lot of additional out-of-pocket expenses. My, my personal concern is with the number of health-related bankruptcies that there are in the U.S., I'm not sure that's going to be substantially reduced. The, the amount of money people owe maybe to a hospital, instead of owing the hospital $100,000, they only owe them $25,000. Well, for the average American, it doesn't matter. It's all monopoly money. The hospitals or the other providers will get a bigger chunk now. Instead of writing off the $100,000, they only have to write off $20,000. Who, who's making up the rest? Well, we, we as the American public are. So again, it goes back to what are we going to decide as a country we're willing to be able to afford? So people need to know that these metal levels, they're gonna have very uh, benefits, one of which may be uh, more narrowed networks, which we were talking about uh, earlier, networks provider networks. Just the Avera doctors or just the, the people from doctors, Westington Springs or, doctors, <laughs> yeah. or just this little packet of doctors you can go to. Uh, I know that some people say they can't. I want to go to the Mayo Clinic. No, you can't go to the Mayo. You you can come to the specialist that we have available in Sioux Falls or Rapid City. Yeah. To, that kind of. Can event. I interrupt? To, just to get back to metal levels, the way those were structured, the bronze level is has been structured by the actuaries that it would cover a roughly 60 percent of projected costs. Silver level 70, gold level 80, and platinum level 90. And so that's that gives you an idea, an idea of, of where, where did these levels come from. So I'm right. sorry, I yeah, interrupted. Okay. Now I'm going to throw a thought good. in. This is, this is, I'm the devil's advocate. I personally believe that it's a better idea to reform insurance than to let it auger into the ground and self-destruct in the next five years and end up with a single-payer system, which would be the government system. In other words, the insurance, it, everybody has Medicare. Uh, and Medicare happy, works. I mean, Medicare, Medicare works. works. Well, <laughs> Medicare A is the only thing that's covered. Understand that Medicare Part B, which covers physicians, that you still have to go to a private insurance company to get that. Right. And then we have Part D, which is pharmaceuticals. So, you know, Medicare is, if, is if you more than one part. If you want to supplement. Right. 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 So here's the devil advocate question. We've got one minute and we're going to move on. But, okay, here it is. Why not just have a single payer system? Think how complicated this whole thing is that we're talking about. It's just, and if you do this, and you may, and there's copper, and then there's gold, and platinum, and uh, I mean, you know, think there, about there, all this. There, Why not just a single pair system? There is absolutely no doubt that from a purely administrative point of view, a single payer system is far and away the most efficient. I mean, Medicare, co the cost, the overhead is 5%. <clears throat> from, from an administrative but, standpoint, an administrative but I don't think from a, a providing quality care to people or... Uh, what the American public would uh, regard as reasonable for wait times and, and would, those I kind would, of I would areas. take issue with that. Medicare is a single-payer system. It's one of the most successful and most popular things the government's ever done. Just ask any politician that tries to mess with Medicare and they will they will be dealt with. Well, Medicare is also going broke though too. So there's well, there's a cost a, issue that we, and we, I was we can at, deal yeah. with that. And it has <laughs> not controlled costs. And no. I guess here's my take home before we take this break. And, you know, I got the last word. This time. <laughs> and that is that I would rather insurance companies be the bad guys in controlling costs than try to depend on the government to be the one to say, no, we won't pay for that. They've never been able to not say no. They, uh, they can't uh, say no. Other, I mean, they can't say on no. On the other hand, neither have insurance companies. No. Well, and that's what we should do is enable insurance to companies to do a better job in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and then we're going to come back after this. While the shroud of information fog is lifting from the Affordable Care Act implementa implementation, there are still questions about its future and concerns as it moves forward. Why are we doing this? What changes will it bring? And what would happen if we ended it now? The Affordable Care Act was um, promoted to expand and cover more Americans. In other words, take care of the uninsured population that we have in this country. And one of the ways that the federal government felt that it may be most efficient to, do, to use and to do would be to expand Medicaid in the states. Um, and so states were given the options of, of, a, of looking at how they could cover more of their citizens through expanding Medicaid. And the federal government said, you know, you know what, states, we'll pay for 90% of that expansion for a number of years if you will expand your, your Medicaid population up to about 138% of poverty. Now that's really important because also within the Affordable Care Act, 
uh, are the, ex the insurance exchanges and other ways that individuals who have not had insurance before can get more insurance. Part of the problem is, even with the exchanges, many of those insurance plans that are available to individuals are beyond the financial means to, to a lot of, at least South Dakota citizens. And especially those that are below 100% of federal poverty, let alone those between 100 and 138. Governor Dugard is concerned about the federal government's commitment. The federal government has said that we'll pay for 90% of the expansion costs, which will be considerable for a state, even though in South Dakota that's about 40,000 individuals. And he's concerned that the about the federal government's ability to con continue its long-term commitment out through about 2018 to 2020. Now, the South Dakota State Medical Association has taken a position to at least cover those below 100% of federal poverty. And these are working individuals in South Dakota. These are not individuals just sitting around not doing anything. These are families that need, need health insurance coverage. Because we know that folks that have insurance coverage are healthier and live longer. Patients who have no insurance get their health care taken care of because they come to emergency rooms or they go to physicians' offices and we take care of them. Hospitals take care of them, physicians take care of them. South Dakota has chosen to expect that the provider community, both hospitals and physicians, take care of those that are un uninsured or underinsured in this state. And by expanding Medicaid, we get insurance coverage to far more of our citizens, and it helps to take care of that. We expand the responsibility from the, just the provider community to the entire community of South Dakota. Iowa just got a waiver and to do something rather interesting. They're gonna take Medicaid dollars and go out to their insurance exchange and buy insurance coverage for Medicaid recipients. And they believe it'll be able to be done a lot Le with a lot less expense than just expanding the Medicaid rolls. So I believe there are options for South Dakota. And we continue to encourage the governor to talk to the physicians of South Dakota to see if we can't come up with some solutions that will take care of South Dakotans and work for South Dakota. I think a lot of people believe that it's going to be very difficult to change the Affordable Care Act or repeal the Affordable Care Act because we are a long way down the road. But let's say it happened. I think the next inevitable discussion will be about a single payer system because we, we can no longer afford to continue this upward spiral of cost and, and dealing with folks who have no insurance. And so I think the next inevitable discussion will be around a single payer system with the government being that single payer and whether or not traditional health insurance uh, types of programs exist or not, I'm not sure. But I don't know that we can afford to take this country through another big discussion about how we're gonna cover our citizens. That was the president of the South Dakota State Medical Association, Dan Heineman, and it was interesting that his last comment was that if, if, it re, if we repeal uh, the insurance reforms that, uh, uh, that uh, the ACA has provided, we will end up with a single-payer Medicare for all system. Do you think, do you, both of you, do you think that's true? No. And, and you? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we, we, we get worried about uh, images and we have this image of socialized medicine as some boogeyman that everybody's terribly afraid of. Medicare is socialized medicine and, ever, and, and it's extremely popular. So I think we, we need to look at the reality, we need to look at the specifics, we need to look at the facts and to try to, I mean certainly the easiest solution if the ACA uh, fell apart would be to put everybody on Medicare. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I'm not quite sure. But I do believe Medicare works. The health of our elderly population has improved dramatically over the time that Medicare has been in uh, in action or been Point in Point of work. clarification, though, is okay. Medicare is a socialized payment system where they are contracting with private 
entities, physicians, hospitals, but, in general, uh, to provide those services. What's going to happen when these providers decide that they don't want to be in Medicare or the government decides to cut payments enough, let's say, you know, to physician payments enough that the physicians say, well, we can't afford to contract with that service provider which is the the or that payer and the only payer happens to be medicare then it i think i i see a a, a problem in that area right the, and, the, the and only heard, the I'm only that. the only country that has totally socialized medicine is britain where the doctors actually work for the, the work government. for the government uh, in canada which we hear the the canadian physicians are mostly in private independent practices okay. that contract with the government sort of like medicare yeah and, like they have, they, and they have a private insurance component in that country okay. as well. now you said no to the fact that you don't think that if medicare if aca uh, was uh, was reversed yeah that that we would end up with a single payer system i don't but because I, I have more faith in my physician brethren, I think, around the country that, that I don't think it would come to that. I, I will clarify my response and say, I don't think, I, I agree with Dr. Hyman, I don't think the Affordable Care Act is going to be repealed in its entirety. Rarely does a law of this expanse get totally removed. I, I see it being altered. One of the, the things that we're going to have to happen to make this work is the government's going to have to find ways to get a lot more young, healthy, individuals on these insurance rules. Yeah, well, that's a very important question, the, the individual mandate part of that. That means that everybody should have insurance. I mean, if everybody, anybody who wants insurance can go to Med Dakota Care and say, I want insurance, I've got terrible kidney disease and heart disease and I know I'm going to cost a bundle, I want insurance, you have to say yes. The only re uh, recompense that you also have is that you have all these young people that are on your rolls that you would uh, that that would help balance the cost of that, but it's not happening. What's what's what, why are we not getting our young people on the on the rolls, Paul? Well, I think in general it's it's that young invincible philosophy. I don't need it now. They know that th there are provisions that you can sign up. You're not going to be able to get your insurance the same day, but typically within a couple weeks from when you sign up, that can activate. So, so you can not sign up, pay the penalty. There's no pre-existing condition. There are stipulations where you can people can go on and off this pretty easily. Uh, so uh, yeah, people I, aren't you, people are pretty smart. I mean, they're they're going to know how to how the system works and how can they can use it to their advantage. So what would you do to change it? What what should you do to make people the younger people get on this system? I mean, don't you think that's what should happen? I think some changes would have to be made in what's considered essential benefits. I think there's going to have to be some more liberalities in giving insurance companies op more options for people other than j just these four metal options because a lot of people are finding that boy things are all of a sudden a lot more expensive than my original plan that the government has said that I can't I can't get that anymore. I totally, so that's going to be a challenge. I totally agree with you. I that's think a, we need a bare bones policy that th everybody There is a gets. catastrophic policy that's available for certain young people. I don't know all the details, but there is one other option besides the four metal plans. But you know, uh, the problem with a catastrophic p policy is that it doesn't cover primary care. I know. It just covers it, when they come in. And it is. It just covers benefits. catastrophes. <laughs> and then they don't come in. I mean, yeah, and they yeah. don't monitor so, the things that they need. The, 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 what is happening though, and, and this was a big debate when the, when the law was being considered in Congress, was at what level to set that penalty. And right this year, the penalty is only $95. The, the second year goes to $300 and the third year goes to $600. So the penalty for not signing up becomes more and more onerous as time goes on. So there, there will be a heavier pressure. And the, the experience in Massachusetts where we, we have a model to, to that uh, where they've already experimented with this, in, in their uh, experience, the, the young people were the last ones to sign up. And they had a big rush of young folks at the end of the sign-up period. So I, I think the... the did they have, what kind of penalty did they have? I mean, what I, size? I, I really don't know what the and, penalty And the sign-up will go until about mid-February. I think the cutoff will be March 1st when things start. It's the end so. of March, isn't it? I, well, anyway, does, anyway yeah, 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 we've got a, a, we got a couple of months, of months to go. And, and the, the belief is, and of course <coughs> we'll wait and see, is that we will see uh, uh, more of the young people sign up? Actually, the, the the age, the average age of people that are signing up in South Dakota is is below the national average. So oh, wow. we are getting more young people than they are nationally. There was a big report that just came out that talked about 
big headlines that were getting just the older folks. But in South Dakota, the people that are signing up are somewhat younger. So Maybe we, we're going to be all right. There, I, there is debate, though, at the national level on whether there's enough younger people that have signed know, up now. Right I, now, it's about 24%. You know, at the younger not, ages. I think we're going to have to wait and see because that's all speculation. It I is. Mean, it it's is. It's all speculation. But we will know in about three or four months whether we've got a problem or not. Okay, I'm going to go back to this one. You just brought it up. I think it's huge, and that is that we, the government has said, okay, we need to have at least these things, and then they've listed all of these things that they've required, which is requiring the insurance companies to give a lot more than what they would really like to, to give. And it isn't the bare bones. Not that they... They wouldn't like to give it. So I think people need to have more options. They need to be able to do better customization. And I'll use Dakota Care's, uh, you know, private exchange that we have. It offers employers more customization capabilities to allow these people to pick the the exact type of benefits that they want. So short commercial, but but I think on a, on a larger level, the federal government needs to replicate something like that. I agree. I, I think we need to have insurance has some laterality to move around to find a bare bones, inexpensive, competitive, cost controlling policy that helps us. Uh, but, but if you do that, Rick, you don't include the primary care, you don't include the preventive services, you know, that's well, the problem. Yeah. If, if, and we, but it's we also know people's choice, we, though, that they're Well, I understand that, that. But, but those are the things that have been excluded in, tr in trying to keep costs down. But we know how incredibly important they are if we're going to try to reduce the burden of disease. Yeah, right. And, and, and to enhance the, the wellness, which will reduce the costs. Right. right. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, and, and I want to say advertisement for Dakota Care. What a great thing that you've done with wellness. Go, what is it, Wellness South Dakota. What's, be Well, South, be well South, Dakota. South Dakota. And we have promoted it numbers of times, and I'll say that, go to that on site. Um, so uh, we've, we don't have much time left. Let's, let's, let's two minutes. So let's, what do we need to say to the people about this issue uh, before we, we uh, kind of bring it to a, a finish? I would say people need to be very well informed. If, if they're confused or they can't access the website, talk to one of the navigators, talk to an agent. Find out if they're eligible for subsidies. Find out if they're not uh, being offered insurance by their employer, why? And, and then go out there and start being a educated consumer, but also be more responsible for your own health care. I think that's an area that, that is lacking in, the, in this country. The, the patient needs to have more skin in the game. You said that uh, uh, during a, a break time. I think that the, the only way to control costs is if the patient feels the cost and makes a choice that has uh, issues about cost. But I mean, it's on the big items, not just the small items. We have, a, uh, a few, you know, we got a little bit more time. Tom, what do you think that we need to make sure that everybody hears? Uh, one of the things that I think we all need to take a step back, I think one of the most troubling parts of this whole experience over the last couple of years is the influence of the partisan politics. We need to, we should, this is an immensely complicated problem. We need the best thinkers from the right and the left and the middle to actually talk to each other and say, you know, what can we do to make sure that our healthcare system is really as good as the American people deserve? Uh, and, and we're not there because we've got rejection. Uh, one side offers a suggestion, the other side immediately rejects it, whether it's valid or not. That is not the way democracy should be working. And so I think this, this law is, is a good start. I'm obviously a strong supporter. And I think that, but I, it's only a start. And, and we, it needs to be altered, it needs to be amended, it needs to be fixed. But we're moving in the right direction. But we need everybody. We need to be talking. We need to be talking to each other instead of just throwing rocks. You've yep. got to have improved value for the investment that yep. we're putting yep. into yep. it. We yep. have to find value. Absolutely. Yep. We'll be back right after this. With 2013 behind us, our thoughts turn to romance. That's right. We're entering a time of year symbolized by none other than the flu bug. Did you know flu season usually doesn't peak until February, sometimes even later? Why take chances? It's not too late to get vaccinated because stopping the flu starts with you. Take a minute and walk in someone else's moccasins. An early 30-something single man called me before coming into the clinic to explain he had no insurance 
but knew his kidneys were failing. He'd lost his job, lost his insurance, and he couldn't find affordable insurance once they heard he had a familial polycystic kidney problem. Another patient was a 40-something woman who had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, treated, thought she was cured, and now, six years later, was having symptoms of recurrence. Her husband had switched jobs in the last few years, and their new health insurance put a rider on her coverage so that it wouldn't pay for anything related to ovarian cancer. These are real stories, a real crisis, clarifying why insurance reform was needed. Here in the U.S., up until the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or ACA, insurance companies had to compete in the marketplace by avoiding cases which would expose them to significant expense. If an insurance company covered too many people with chronic illness, that insurance company would either have to raise their rates so high that no one would buy their product, or they would go bankrupt in short order. The system in the U.S. had evolved into one that made it difficult to cover the very people who needed insurance the most. Indeed, it was time for our political leaders to either reform insurance or to develop a single-payer universal insurance, which would virtually eliminate the health care insurance industry as we know it today. Some would call this an improvement, and some would say this would be very bad. Now we have the ACA. But indeed, there would be problems with this new health care law, including the healthcare.gov uh, website sign-up glitch, the inadequate penalty for not being insured, the confusion that will, that will follow for newly insured, the inadequate coverage for the working poor in South Dakota and 20 other states where Medicaid coverage has not yet expanded, and the predicted flood of new patients who will be trying to find a primary care doctor instead of using the emergency room for their primary care. Despite these and more problems, now my patients with kidney disease and ovarian cancer can be adequately insured. There will be problems to, the, to fix and details to change, but insurance reform was the right thing to do. Well, we've got a few minutes to talk about it. Well, any comments? We're talking about the Medicare, Medicaid expansion, expansion. Some states are wavering. We're doing something in this state. The and, governor and has changed some positions. Yeah, I, I think that, that there's been a fear that, that uh, I think, especially on the part of some of the Republicans, that, that if they supported Medicaid expansion, they'd be seen supporting a, Obamacare, quote unquote, and that's been uh, political. Uh, very political. I see there's, there, there is so much benefit to expanding Medicaid that even a number of very conservative Republican governors, John Kasich in Ohio has been the one that's most, uh, a, a guy whose conservative credentials are unassailable, has said that we have to do this because it's the right thing to do. And uh, Governor Brewer in Arizona, Governor Scott in Florida, th people that are extremely conservative have all argued, supported it. Supported it. So it, it shouldn't be a political issue. Let's look at the reality and not the speculation. Right, Paul? As a society, I think we will ultimately, ultimately be judged by how we care for the, for the least of these, for those who are the most in need. The challenges are making sure we can properly identify those in need, those in Medicare right now, the yeah. vast majority are kids, uh, those disabled, Medicaid, Medicaid yeah. excuse me. Uh, are those children and, and disabled, and we're talking about expanding it to more working, ad working able-minded working adults. And again, we have to see, it, is, is it affordable to the state? Can we afford that without additional taxes, without additional burdens on the, on the state government funding? I think that's, that's the fundamental question that our legislature will have to debate here in the next couple months. Well, I, you know, I think politicians, for the most are very well-minded and we've got a very kind and caring governor he's conservative uh, and I my sense is he'll 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 come to what the right answer is and we both we've all agreed what might be the right answer but I think we're we're going there in the right direction because that's what we need to do is cover those people who can't be covered right your example 
examples that you gave earlier are excellent. And they're both extremely high cost conditions that you have to have a lot of very healthy individuals People paying to premiums them. to cover those two individuals. This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our studio guests, Dr. Tom Dean and Dr. Paul Amundsen, for helping to explain the Affordable Health Care Act at this point. And as the great general and president Dwight D. Eisenhower knew, plans are nothing, planning is everything. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call Television is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.